I see you did a whole new intro for season eight. Is it still over 60 seconds? Sin. Also, this damn show single-handedly encouraged so many other shows to draw out their introduction with fancy visuals. But why go through the trouble of creating a map when you're going to depict King's Landing without Blackwater Rush running alongside it? Foreboding. Bow shadowing? This child is running through a snowy forest and over an icy stream with no mittens, no wool hat, and no boots with the fur. Did no one warn him that winter was coming? Running between people when running around them is clearly an option. No, no, don't climb things when you're a child in this show. You'll be booted to your doom by a sex crazy sibling or yeeted by a yeti or iced by an oversized iguana. This glancing between people goes on for all the some time and the only thing we gain from it is a reminder of Arya's feelings. Ugh, feelings. Northerners don't much trust outsiders. I get that dragons often have amazing dramatic timing, it's like in their character sheet and everything, but the question is, how did they even hear this conversation from that far away to know when to swoop in? We already saw this in the two minute long opening credits show. Just because you have dragons now doesn't mean you get to go all throne drone on your cinematography. Also, this doesn't look anything like the shot in the opening credits. Sure, the shape's mostly correct, but the building placement is all wrong, and I don't even see any of the letters of Winterfell written in the snow anywhere. We don't have time for all this. Thank you, Bran! I've been trying to say this. There's only six episodes left to wrap up the entire story. This kid's smart. Someone should make that boy the king. <laughs> uh, king Bran. As if. The Night King has your dragon. He's one of them now. If the Night King can turn animals, why hasn't he created an army of former wolverines, bears, and mooses? Moosei? Moosepusses? It's not important. I agree! So on to the battles and dragons and betrayals and twists! Not yet? Fine, must be saving this episode's big battle for the middle, huh? We named you King in the North. You know the beer commercial where someone would start a what's up chain? It was so frustrating because you'd be sitting at dinner and someone would whisper, what's up? And then you'd reflexively just jut your tongue out and spout out, what's up? Like a fucking caveman. I'm just saying that chanting King of the North is the Game of Thrones version of that viral audio STD chanting. I hate it. I chose the North. Okay, but can someone tell me what the North is? It seems important. They keep on saying it. And soon the Lannister army will ride north to join our cause. Thinking that Tyrion would actually believe this for even a second. And yes, Sansa calls him out on it later, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm super sad that Tyrion is apparently gullible and dumb now. What do dragons eat, anyway? Whatever they want. This is literally one of the oldest jokes in the book. I mean, sure, it was originally written about where a 500 pound gorilla would sleep, but the punchline was the same. My point is that this joke flew in from the distant past and boy are its arms tired. Last time we spoke was at Joffrey's wedding. Miserable affair. It had its moments. <laughs> okay, now that was funny. Staring, 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 staring. Excitement? How did you sneak up on me? How did you survive a knife through the heart? People who answer questions with unrelated questions. Also, the show fails to remind the audience of how resurrected people in bloody tear trees make any damn bit of sense. Have you ever used it? Asking a woman if she knows how to use a needle. Sansa thinks she's smarter than everyone. She's the smartest person I've ever met. Sansa? I mean, she did let Littlefinger convince her to turn away Brienne as her protector, so maybe let's not be so vehement about putting her at the top of that list. 20,000 men, is it? Yes, Your Grace. A few died in transit. And this episode is taking so much time on drawn out conversations and political maneuverings that it might as well have been a Star Wars prequel. But at least we'll get to some dragons of death soon. Not yet? Fine. Must be saving this episode's big battle for the end, huh? I've executed men for less. They were lesser men. This works. That boy Eddie. The ginger. <sighs> That's him. Came back with his face burnt right off. Talking about Ed Sheeran's melted skin during sexual intercourse. You're not boring. I'll give you that. Thing not a single person said to this episode of television somehow makes its way into the script. Probably the most confusing part of this episode is the amount of time it takes Theon to cut his sister's bonds with the weapon that split a head open like a melon a moment ago. <laughs> Siblings. I kill the bastards anyway. That's Jon Snowist. I sense that you're leading to a proposal. A proposal is what I'm proposing. And I made you follow my alludings all the way up here because I enjoy the sound of my own voice and could not be bothered to express myself down below because my fragile ego cannot soar as it deservedly does up here. John and Daenerys don't want to listen to lonely old men. Samesies! Skip! What's up with all these bones? I would think the dragons just ate their prey whole and were able to digest the bones in the fire of their belly or something. What good's it being a dragon if you still have to pick the bones clean with your paws and jaws? Then I've enjoyed your company, Jon Snow. Do you ever stop and think of how on the nose and easy to spell Jon Snow's name is because he's a bastard? I wish everyone's name were that simple. Then I wouldn't have to Google it every time I mentioned his love interest, Jane Fire, or their arch enemy, Susie Incest. Jon Snow is not impaled on a dragon spine spike in this, or the following scene. Sweet! Jon Snow and Jane Fire are gonna do full dragon warfare and toast some fools! Oh, it's just gonna be some How to Train Your Dragon Joyride montage, isn't it? 
Also, shouldn't she know he's a Targaryen since he survived riding a dragon? Or is that just in the book? Either way, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times. The books matter! Can someone explain why both Daenerys and Jon look so warm and cozy? They've just had their faces blown around by northern winds while atop dragons, mind you. And their lips aren't even chapped. Drogon doesn't say, you're f***ing your aunt, in this scene. Isn't easy making a blade that big with dragon glass. Blowing smoke up someone's axe. Here's my wish. This weapon probably turns out to be important, but I'm gonna go ahead and sin that she fails to give any dimensional details. Is this thing supposed to be long like a lance? Short like a dagger? Itty bitty like a hairpin? How is Gendry supposed to interpret the important details from this? Do you think we can beat the army of the dead without her? Thinking there's anyone strong enough you could recruit to beat the Snyder Bros. I borrowed a few books from the Citadel. Grand Theft Reading. <laughs> Jump mares. Okay, I've put this off long enough. Last time John was here, Ned said, the next time we see each other, we'll talk about your mother, I promise. And now the next time he's here, Sam will tell him about his lineage. Payoffs like that and several other echoes of season one throughout this episode are the reason this show can deliver like no other. And I can't help but give another sin off. I had a high septum's diary. Bran had whatever Bran has. Well, it's nice to see Sam's put about as much thought into explaining Bran's gifts as the writers of this show. The Umber Boy. Yep, that's right. Instead of seeing any big White Walker battles, we only get to see the aftermath of one. Not that it looks like it was much of a battle. Not exactly a ringing endorsement for Umber Armor, if you ask me. Protect this house my ass. Episode ends by having Tom Incest and Jake Boredom engage in a staring contest. When I was a child, my brother would tell me a bedtime story about the man who murdered our father. Worst bedtime story ever. Your Grace, I know my brother. Like you knew your sister. Daenerys Targaryen would be the queen of all the kingdoms at TV sins. Mainly because she has dragons in. <laughs> I'm not f***ing with the dragon. But also because of this line of dialogue. Do you want me to apologize? I won't. Rejected TV sins slogan somehow makes its way into the episode. The things we do for love. If Bran is doing a callback to the first episode of season one, it would have been more accurate to say the things you do for love. But since I'm pretty sure this is reference to the English rock band 10CC, I'd be remiss if I didn't critique his complete lack of melody while delivering this lyric. This drab interior. Just because the color palette is appropriate for the story and setting doesn't make it any less of a sin. I suspect one of you will be wearing this before it's all over. I mean, probably not the exact thing Tyrion is wearing. Although, I'd weirdly like to see Jorah in one of Tyrion's outfits now. I will take no questions at this time. Show wants us to believe that Gendry is doing work here, but aside from looking contemptuously at someone actually doing work and touching everything once, all he's done is a little polite hammering and quenched his steel well before he has made anything resembling a weapon. It's not so much that they built the thirst trap, it's all the runtime they're wasting on the foreplay. How many? Few. What are they like? Really bad. Even a Smith's apprentice can do better than really bad. Thank you, Arya. Thought I was gonna have to send these non-answers. Death, that's what they're like. Never mind, I still do. I'm something else now. What is when your character has a long and interesting multi-season arc that seems to be setting you up for a huge payoff, but ultimately the most memorable things you do are giving someone a life-changing seizure and telling your cousin that he's banging his aunt. This guy's wearing a backpack. Not a pack, fastened to his back. Just a modern day backpack. Together again. Episode reminds us we never got a Jamie and Tyrion spin-off sitcom where they're forced to be roommates because of the new tax laws passed in Bravos. But this sparks an idea to form a band and they get to play sets at the local bar where they meet an unruly but funnily group of assholes. <laughs> Public displays of saliva. Was she lying about the baby too? The young in the Game of Thrones-less. Girl's mouth, mouth around my all right, I'll admit this is a line we all laughed at in season one, but the show acts like this is a catchphrase and not something he said to get out of a jam that one time. I'm sure I'll feel some satisfaction denying her that pleasure. Schadenfreude. I came to Winterfell because I'm not the fighter I used to be. Because he's the man with the golden hand. When I heard you named Tyrion your hand, it broke my heart. Game of skips. I was hoping we could speak alone. It's not only that I hate how much this episode is made up of long-winded conversations, it's also that I hate how much every conversation's trying to set up something instead of giving us any kind of closure on the multitude of storylines that are finally converging. Now I'm here, half a world away. And this reminds me, this show has done a piss poor job of explaining the size of this Dyson sphere. I'm here because I love your brother. Aww, ew. But then I survived the Battle of the Bastards. Reminding me that I'd much rather be rolling commercials on that episode instead of watching this one. Which way should I go? Either this is a heavy-handed reference to Shireen Baratheon, or the show thinks Sir Davos is incapable of being an empathetic father figure to children without facial scars. All right, I'll defend the crypt then. Show has four episodes left after this one, and it's wasting precious time on scenes like this. I get why fans complained, but I think they may have been complaining about the wrong things. 
Oh, wow. We're getting a heartfelt reunion of, you know, these people. Why are there so many names to keep up with? We have limited mental space here. My friend has five kids. And he gave up on remembering their names after child three. We had to travel around them to get here. So they took a longer route, but still arrived before the Night King? Show thinks the White Walkers are making time to stop and smell the corpses. Show forgets that we as viewers have been preparing for this battle for seven seasons. And doesn't think that we might find it absurd that our protagonists have waited for the final few hours before the battle to form a plan. They follow his command. If he falls, getting to him may be our best chance. This band of heroes rests their entire plan on this single theory. They don't even come up with a contingency plan just in case the Death Star-sized plot convenience turns out not to be true. He'll never expose himself. Preposterous! This is HBO. What does he want? An endless night. Mixing up your Agatha Christie with your George R.R. Martin. It's easier to do than you think. Game of Thrones is essentially and then there were none with dragons and incest. He wants to erase this world. And I am its memory. Even if I, for the moment, disregard how much I believe this motivation to be complete bullshit, their plan still hinges on the Night King trying to snuff out Bran mid-battle. And considering he's waited seven seasons to come south of the wall at all, it's fair to assume he's a patient man. Your memories don't come from books. No one's memory comes from a book, unless the memory's about the time you were reading a book. But even then, it didn't really come from a book as much as it is about a book. If I wanted to erase the world of men, I'd start with you. Is that a... is that a compliment? I took this castle from you. Let me defend you now. Using the reason someone shouldn't trust you is the reason that they should trust you. Survive the fifth of the first men. The third, fourth, and fifth men are when it really becomes a test of wills. It wasn't so simple. I was sleeping with my sister and you had one friend in the world who was sleeping with his sister. This might be the most f***ed up explanation of simplicity in the history of TV and film. But Nikolai Coster Waldau pulls it off so beautifully, I think he deserves a tip of the sin hat. You want some of this piss? Thank you, my lord. I don't think that's wise. Getting grog blocked. That's how I got so strong. Giant's milk. <laughs> Tormund is the best part of this episode. But also, Tormund is the best part of this episode. Come on, Tormund, you've got to turn the horn 90 degrees when you get to the bottom, or the air bubbles will rise and cause the contents to spill out. Someone didn't study their beer fest. I think we might live. You still might, but you'd have had a better shot at survival if you'd stopped seeing who can get alcohol poisoning the fastest a few hours before the battle commences. But you do you, Winterfell defenders. Women can't be knights. Why not? Tradition. F tradition. Seriously, how is f***ing Tormund the voice of logic in this episode? Arise, Brienne of Tarth, a knight of the Seven Kingdoms. Roll commercials. My name, my real name, is Aegon Targaryen. Thinking this reveal that we all knew was coming could somehow make up for this episode being boring as sh When one of your best lit sequences in the entire episode is the opening credits, that's not great. Giving your main characters the glory of being on the front line when we all know there isn't a chance in hell that any of them are dying in the initial onslaught. I'd have given back all the sins if f***ing Sam was taken out by a stray arrow in the first few minutes. Then I'd have spent the episode caring about who was going to survive instead of f***ing around with my contrast settings. Oh, for f***'s sake. It took your time. Attempting to conceal your your late sin behind a you took your time greeting. Now you have two sins. Man, they've got a nice sized army here ready and willing to fight the dead, but it still makes no sense that the USS Enterprise isn't here to help the fight. Just in case I never get a chance to sin favor the bold from season 6 of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, this seemed like as good a place as any to do it. I'm actually glad Wolfie the White is here. Finally gives me someone to root for. Not because I'm particularly attached to him, but because he's the only damn character I'm going to be able to see. And if you like this shot, you're going to love the rest of the episode. Okay, if you haven't guessed it already, this Sins video will have a theme. Just wanted to let you know, rather than, you know, keeping you in the dark. I find it very strange that John isn't on the front line with his people like he was for the Battle of the Bastards, or basically every single time there's any fighting at all. I know he's the only other person that knows how to fly a dragon, but do they really need a pilot? Can Danny not just tell them to do what dragons do in the general direction of the bad guys? Sir Davos is acting as if he knows the figure in the distance is Melisandre. And that is some retina-defying superhuman visioning levels of total bullshit. Maybe if it was daylight, the distinctive red hair would be a giveaway, but she's wearing a f***ing hood? Oh, f*** yo. I'm glad all the Dothraki heard Jorah. The back row could have very easily been a Dothraki kebab. Seems like Melisandre should have given at least a heads up as to what she was going to do. Also, why are the Dothraki the only ones that get the eternal flame advantage? If you're gonna bring spells to class, Melisandre, you need to bring enough for everyone. Also, also, this is a cool visual, but everyone's acting as if Melisandre just turned these things into f***ing lightsabers when they're just on fire. If this is really gonna make a difference, why don't they do it themselves? It's exactly what they do with arrows, so stop f***ing about and get those shafts oiled. Wait. There's no need to execute me, Sir Devos. I'll be dead before the dawn. This works. 
This episode has so many long stares that I can only assume the set was as poorly lit as the show itself and that this is just everyone's way of making sure that their eyes have adjusted before accidentally delivering their lines to a wall. So part of the battle plan was just to have Jorah and the Dothraki blindly charge the army of the dead. They had the likes of Daenerys, Jorah, Grey Worm, Ser Davos, Tyrion, Jon, and Jaime planning this shit. And this was the best they could come up with? This will be a long night indeed. But mostly for the audience. Okay, this is a pretty badass shot, and since I probably won't be able to see the rest of the episode well enough to remove any more sins, I guess we'll take it off here. However, if your big set piece is so dark that you have to rely on flaming swords to allow us to see what the hell is going on, I think you may be taking the realism thing a touch too seriously. Especially when that realism doesn't extend to a very angry ice smurf raising an army of zombies on the back of a dragon. Wouldn't it have been a good idea to launch these badass siege weapons before you send in your first wave of Dothraki to the slaughter? I can see waiting until you know the enemy's within range, but they fire them before the Dothraki even make contact, so what do they know now that they didn't know a few minutes ago? I mean, why should they show the battle between the Dothraki and the Storming Dead when we can just see everyone else's expression as they try to ascertain how the battle is going? That was a much better idea. <sighs> the Night King is coming. The dead are already here. What the f*** is Danny doing? Did she seriously expect the Night King to fly in first and politely present himself for inspection before sending in his minions? The plan was to stay back, protect Bran, and lure in the Night King. Nothing that's happened in the first five minutes of this battle is surprising enough to warrant immediately abandoning that plan. Earlier somebody shouted, Pentagon! Presumably to make sure they don't wipe out their own people. But since that battle's clearly done, why didn't they reload and start firing again? Also, why are these incredibly long-range siege weapons positioned on what has very quickly become the front line? Do they never get used again? Why wouldn't you use these again? If you, like us, had been waiting eight years for this epic fight between the undead, the unsullied, the wildlings, and all the other assorted humans, well, then here's a tip how to enjoy it best. Close all the curtains, f*** around with the brightness on your TV, and then take your remote, throw it through the damn screen of frustration, and then just imagine something better in your head. I don't know how to use it. Sticking with the pointy end. We got callbacks, y'all. I mean, no offense to Samuel's fighting abilities. <laughs> well, actually, I mean all of the offense because I find it ridiculous that he survived this long in close contact combat. Shout, get up! Friend saves friend in combat only to then get killed themselves immediately afterward. Cliché. Also, one of the unique things about the early seasons of Game of Thrones was that you truly felt no one was safe and anyone could die at any point. The problem with killing poor Ed here is that, yes, it could randomly happen, but he's just lovable enough to make me sad and not important enough to make me care. So now I'm just sad and left wondering, why Ed? Why Ed? Now, in fairness, I've never flown a dragon, but they're capable of flying straight up, yes? I just feel like rising above the storm would be a better option than blindly flying around inside of it. John actually believes that Danny would be able to hear him. What is this? A battlefield for ants? Light the trench! Light the trench! Are we supposed to believe that Davos can hear Grey Worm? Why does no one in this episode seem to grasp the concept of how sound travels? Oh, good. Glad we're getting more of the how to train your dragon in the fog scenes. This episode is 80 minutes, and this episode did not need to be 80 minutes. She can't see us. Welcome to the party, pal! If Melisandre can conjure up enough fire to fill up an entire trench, there are clearly some skills of hers they're not putting to use against the army of the dead ice people. Meanwhile, on Tales from the Crypt. At least we're already in a crypt. <laughs> I'm laughing, but holy sh**, dude, there are children and terrified civilians down here that probably aren't as accepting of your dark humor as the audience at home is. If we were up there, we might see something everyone else is missing. I can say, with confidence, you would not. Maybe we should have stayed married. And maybe we should just go ahead and skip. The things I did. Everything you did brought you where you are now. Home. Never mind about betraying Rob, stealing Winterfell, killing Sir Roderick, abandoning Sansa, and his actual sister Yara. Oh, and those two kids he executed because he thought they were his adopted brothers. All is forgiven because he came home? Great, you've got the White Walkers stalled as the trench is burning. This might be a great time to start shooting arrows and killing as many as you can. Oh, just... Gonna wait until they form a plan to get past the burning trench? Great call. Also, the fire mode is pretty badass, but did no one see this tactic coming? I mean, this thing is, what, 10 feet wide? Dead overcame it in a matter of minutes. How was this ever a viable defense? Game of the World War Z Army of Darkness. Clegane! Lord Beric here knows damn well that Clegane has a pretty severe version of flamey things, so perhaps beckoning him with a very sharp flamey thing isn't the best way of getting him back in the game. Okay, if they're gonna show one piece of combat, clearly, I'm glad it was Arya kicking all of the undead ass. She f***ing rules. 
But this does prove that somebody putting this shit together knows how to shoot action. And I wish they'd been given a bigger say in how to put this episode together rather than whoever thought it would be better to make us really feel what it's like to fight our way out of a slightly amber paper bag. Looks like Lady Mormont went to the Rick and Stark school of not getting the fuck out of the way of a stampeding giant. So not only did the Winterfell gang not lead the fight with the dragons, their best option, the zombies decided to wait to bring in the fucking zombie giant. Neither of these parties deserves a win today. Man, this is fucked up even for Game of Thrones. And fortunately, this mindless giant will play with its food long enough and at eye level enough for Lady Mormont to stab it in the brain. Look, I know this is supposed to be an epic moment, but it's hard to get excited when it feels more staged than Eowyn facing down Sauron. I suppose now is as good a time as any to ask how exactly does the dragon breath work and how long does it last? I mean, the dead dragon seems to be able to sustain this indefinitely, so why would it stop before finishing the job? And why don't we see more of Daenerys and Jon lighting up the army of the dead now that they're committed to the brand he'll be fine plan the point is i don't know whether i'm supposed to be worried for the good guys facing this unstoppable force or pissed off at them for not using their own so they have super hearing sensitive enough to hear a drop of blood across the room since when was that a fucking thing Arya gets out from under the table and behind another bookcase in the second and a half it takes this zombie to bend down and look for her Arya's pretty badass but she's not the fucking flash Fucking hell, Arya! Does she just walk around corners with her blade up at all times? What if that had been Theon or Jorah? Wait, can, can we actually make this Theon or Jorah instead? I get the instinct to act fast, but why would you throw away your awesome sword imbued with power by an actual god knowing there's a good chance you won't be able to get that shit back? This is like Obi-Wan throwing his fucking lightsaber at a group of stormtroopers without the ability to force pull it back. The YouTube gods forbid us from playing the music, but the opening chords of this part of the score sound straight up like the opening of NSYNC's Bye Bye Bye. And it ain't no lie that I'd give back all the sins if we got a battle montage with these sweet, sweet vocal tones of one Mr. Justin Timberlake and one Mr. J.C. Chazé backing it up. I know you. I know I know you. Well, that's exciting and useful information for this episode to be taking its time with presenting 80 minutes long. Just thought I'd mention that again. What do we say to the god of death? Not today. We got even more callbacks, y'all. How is either writer staying on their dragon when they're in this position? And for anyone who says they're holding on tight, I hate you. Jorah translates Drogon's roar perfectly into, Hey, Daenerys is gonna be in some big trouble. We need you to ex machina or some shit. Meet us there in tan. Dracarys. Cool, but weren't Jon and Daenerys armed with any dragon glass? The one thing known to be effective against the White Walkers? No one anticipated the supernatural creature able to raise the dead would attempt to raise the dead. Might have been tricky in the heat of battle, but wouldn't stabbing your own dead with dragon glass, just to be safe, be better than having to face them all over again? <gasps> Earlier, Tyrion protested that his brain was being wasted down here, yet neither he nor anybody else seemed to note the inherent flaw in hiding in a crypt filled with dead bones bodies while being invaded by a creature whose ability to raise the dead features pretty prominently on their resume. The dead have been attacking in hordes this entire episode, but are now running in one at a time, so Theon and his merry men can easily pick them off with their flaming arrows. Dragon Ex Machina. But to be fair, there should have been a hell of a lot more of these throughout the episode. So am I also sending there weren't enough Dragon Ex Machinas? Yes. Yes, I am. Hey, you know those big flappy appendages on the side of your giant lizard? Yeah, those aren't just fancy umbrellas. When flapped, they negate the need to be on the damn ground, which is the only place any of these guys can even remotely cause you a problem. During this sequence, we essentially see every single main character get overwhelmed by undead cannon fodder. And yet, Jorah is the only one who dies. I'm not saying I wanted them all dead, just don't expect to feel any kind of tension or suspense when what you're showing me has no impact on the end result. I realize the fire is blue, so we know it's the Night King's dragon, but that doesn't make blue dragon flames any less of a sin. You're a good man. Now, go and run headfirst into the Night King instead of attempting to buy any more time. I'm honestly not sure if they're about to fight or fuck, and I'm also not sure which I'd rather see. I mean, it can't be any weirder than Theon trying to fuck his sister. Shouting at a dragon. Seriously though, what exactly was Jon's game plan here? This is literally giving up and offering your body up to be barbecued. That means no helping Bran, no saving Winterfell, and no more Westeros. Fortunately, Arya has a bit more sense, but he doesn't know that. After all he's been through, this is where he throws in the towel. Okay, that was f***ing cool. 
Sure is handy that every single one of these creatures is linked to the Night King. I mean, this was a huge fucking gamble and they'd have been completely screwed otherwise. Also, it looks like the White Walker army went to the blip school of dying very gradually instead of all at once. The TV Sins University should really think about getting a bigger campus. I guess I won't be needing this anymore. Where's the wall debris? These two minutes of credits continue to be unrealistic and a waste of our precious time, which honestly makes them fit in with the rest of season eight pretty well. I'm so tired of the body objectification of a camera scanning from toe to head of a character. He's a corpse for Pete's dragon's sake. I don't care how dead sexy you find Jorah, enough of this pale gaze. Once again, I'm bemused by the lighting choices this show makes as it's resulted in Theon looking a thousand percent more ginger than he actually is. And even more bafflingly makes Sansa look like she gives a shit that he's dead. We're here to say goodbye to our brothers and sisters. Only two of them were really all that important, and honestly, even they were fairly dispensable. But hey, there's probably at least three seasons of the show left, so no rush in doing anything too dramatic. Everyone in this world owes them a debt that can never be repaid. But the reward for those who fought and survived is to march through the snow for two weeks to fight another war that also ends up being decided by a dragon anyway. Honestly, I think cremation may actually be preferable. It is our duty and our honor to skip for as long as men draw breath. You know who should draw breath? The CG artist. How am I supposed to believe it's cold out here when I can't even see anyone doing any atmospheric vaping? Pyromania. I was kind of hoping to see the awe and expanse of this funeral, but they died as they lived, shrouded in frustrating darkness. Also, show spends a full 5 minutes and 47 seconds displaying, mourning, and burning the dead. This episode did not need to be an hour and 17 minutes long, and I swear it's mocking me into noting every occasion of self-indulgence until we identify what the true runtime should have been. BC and I, you can still smell the burning bodies, and that's where your head is at. Clegane is a dick to Gendry's head. Wait. You are aware he took my family's throne and tried to have me murdered. Daenerys spends about three minutes trolling Gendry before awarding him a lordship instead of just getting to the good part. I swear the writers made every part of this season into a metaphor for the season itself. The last time I saw her, I told her I'd kill her if I ever saw her again. This entire scene is Sir Davos telling Tyrion something we already know and he doesn't care about it, and Tyrion replying with something we also already know and Sir Davos doesn't particularly care about. I guess because, hey, isn't it cool that these two people are talking? And for some reason, we had to make every episode a feature-length movie. We play his game from, we fight his war and win. And then he f***s off. No signs, no blessings. Who knows what he wants? Benny and Weiss's unfiltered thoughts on George R.R. R. Martin somehow make their way into the script. Your turn. Uh, you are an only child. I told you I was. Show has time for this. Actually, I think that's the official tagline on the season A poster. What kind of person climbs on a fucking dragon? A madman or a king? We will now linger on Daenerys processing this profound statement with brooding and ominous music behind her, as if this is the first time she's ever had to deal with how sexism might impact her rule. She's been a badass giving zero f up until now, but the show wants to plant some seeds so that it'll make sense as her character makes a story shift through seasons nine and 10. You're a virgin. Sweet! I was hoping one of the plot lines during the Overstuff Season 8 would be a quest for Brienne to lose her virginity like some sort of 80s sex comedy. Game of Thrones losing it. Let's go! We did it! We faced those icy f***s! My celebratory outburst after completing my Frosty the Snowman inspired sex tape somehow makes its way into the episode. Tormund stares at Brienne. Jaime stares at Tormund. Tormund stares at Jaime. Tormund stares at Tyrion. Tyrion stares at Tormund. Podrick stares at Tormund. Tormund stares at Podrick. Is this season sponsored by Stairmaster? This f***er comes north and takes her from her. One positive I'll give season eight is that it really did try to tie up every single loose end. Even the ones we don't give a sh** about, like Tormund pursuing Brienne. I'm sure everyone was dying to know where that was leading and equally relieved when the answer was nowhere. I've seen much worse than you since then. Being called the nicest kid at bully camp. <laughs> Practicing your archery around hundreds of drunk people. Be my wife. Be the lady of Storm's End. Turning down a proposal with an intimate kiss. Kiss him, fine, but at least say no first. It's bloody hot in here. Using British Nelly as your seduction technique. He loved me, and I couldn't love him back. I mean, mostly it's that we weren't even related in any way, so really, what's the point? Now that we're done talking about the dead guy, I'd like to snog my nephew by the fire for a bit, okay? What happens when they demand you press your claim and take what is mine? I refuse. 
What is John thinking? I get that he's in love, but does he really not see how that idea is pointless? I'm not upset that Johnny Snows is submissive. I'm upset that he's suddenly dumb. I have to tell Sansa and I. Sansa will want to see me gone and you on the Iron Throne. The problem with this argument is that we know John has no intention of not telling Arya and Sansa, and Danny has no intention of backing down and risking her claim to the throne. This episode is filled with arguments that we have no chance of being invested in because eight years of fantastic character development has already told us the outcome. This post-coital shot of Jamie and Brienne is just here as a reminder that these two played sword and sheath together. No dialogue, just a few seconds of refresher since you've probably forgotten it happened among the other 25 minutes of absolutely nothing that's gone on in the episode so far. And now more of your favorite part of Game of Thrones, strategizing over maps. Why get to the actual battle when you could have people just stand around talking about it instead? We need a word. Of course you do. All anybody does in this episode is say words. This episode is so full of people standing around saying things that IMDb actually classifies this episode's genre as talk show. Ah, oh, yeah. We're family. Arya Toretto here is suggesting what? That the four of them can take on the entire world? Lead the Seven Kingdoms from Winterfell? Why does she even care? Isn't she just trying to chase down all the people on her list? The last of the Starks. Roll commercials. <sighs> if only. I need to tell you something. You have to swear you'll never tell another soul. John, of course, spills the incestuous beans to Arya and Sansa, but he can't truly believe they're going to keep this to themselves, can he? John isn't stupid, and he is a great tactician, so what's the advantage of telling them at all if the goal is to make sure they follow Danny? This final season is like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube by peeling off the stickers and putting them in the right place. Yeah, you'll get it in the end, but it's pretty time-consuming and not at all satisfying. But also, finally, some talking that might be interesting. Seeing the Stark kids react to this news is going to be fascinating. Will they immediately push back on their vow to keep it secret? Will they congratulate him on being unbastardized? Will their faces be tinged with joy, fear, anger? If there's one scene that's going to be worth all this incessant talking, it's going to be... And we're already cutting away, aren't we? Also, also, before deciding that the most important conversational bomb drop would happen off screen, John told Bran to tell them. This is not the kind of information you tell secondhand, especially through Bran. He would make winning the lottery sound depressing. You boys are a pair of gold-plated c**ts. Putting molten gold anywhere near your genitals. He's not going to kill us. He wouldn't be told to. But this only proves that Bran's willing to kill a chair with the crossbow. Not either of them. Kill a few hundred people, they make you a lord. Kill a few thousand, they make you king. Kill the last season of an entire fantasy novel series, they make you a Star Wars director. No, my fighting days are done. Because, of course, no one wants to see Braun or Tormund kicking ass in the finale, so let's just sideline them entirely. We wouldn't want to risk having fun now, would we? Some unfinished business. Me too. What's the name of the version of the pronoun game where characters just talk in generalities about their plans instead of just saying the thing that they mean? Bland plan gaming? Detail fail gaming? Can this show just quit talking about stuff and actually do it? The uh, gaming? Take these broken wings and learn to fly again. So convenient and easy. Why her? Sansa says this while literally looking at the most convincing two-winged fire-breathing reasons circling her. The men in my family don't do well in the capital. Haha, -ha, get it? Because my dad got his head chopped off there. I'm funny. What if there's someone else? someone better <laughs> why are all the interesting conversations happening off screen Gah! you're not gonna ride the dragon south Rhaegal needs to heal he doesn't need me weighing him down oh for fuck's sake they're gonna kill Rhaegal aren't they this is farewell then and now a full three minutes and 18 seconds of John saying goodbye to three people and a dog this waste of time makes me particularly mad because this could have been convincingly done in under a minute, and 90% of that minute should have been telling Ghost that he's the goodest boy ever. Also, this lineup of important goodbyes processional couldn't have been more conveniently arranged and timed if they were stationed and released by a wedding planner. Oh, for double f**k's sake, they're gonna kill Masande too, aren't they? How many others now? Including us? Eight. No. Not including you. He literally asked how many others know Tyrion. Words mean something, damn it. Also, pretending like Sam hasn't already spilled the news to Gilly. Somehow, from above, they fail to notice a weapon that has to have line of sight to even work. The show wants us to believe this was a surprise hit, but there is no possible universe where these boats are a surprise to these dragons or Daenerys. Also, why are they even flying so low? 
I think they'd be smart enough to run some high elevation reconnaissance before just dragon bombing into the bay all willy nilly. Also, also, they hit heart, wing, and throat kill shot on their first three shots. Rago is clearly not a luck dragon. Diving head first towards the killer crossbows instead of coming around and toasting their ass from behind. Despite hitting three perfect shots, Euron and his fleet will now miss every following shot because somehow they know there's no way Danny's story was ever going to end here. It took 54 minutes of pointless conversation to get here, but we have made it to some action. I'd like to take a sin off, but my limit on pointless conversation to start a television show is 50 minutes. So close. And also, the action lasts less than a minute. And if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that you never get credit if you last under a minute. This is without a single shadow of a doubt the most pointless did the falling thing kill a character oh we don't know because it faded to black fake out cliche ever. There's no fucking way that this is how Tyrion goes out. And even if the show thinks that we were gullible enough to believe it was, we're given less than 15 seconds to sit with that shock before it's immediately revealed he's safely on shore. What is the fucking point of this episode? This is a mistake. Handling Daenerys' transformation into the Mad Queen in the final two episodes so it feels like a crazy woman trope instead of an earned character descent? Yeah, hard agree. He doesn't want the throne. That's why he bent the knee. Didn't these two just have this conversation on the boat? Like 10 minutes ago? Does he not remember? How hard did Tyrion's head get hit by that mast? I don't think a c is a true qualification, as I'm sure you'd agree. Hey, don't make fun of him for not having a penis. There's an actual phrase for the kind of person that would do that. You d taunt. I believe in our queen. She'll make the right choice. First you believed in Cersei, and now you believe in Daenerys? When did Tyrion turn into a hopeful optimist, and more importantly, when did he lose his cynical wisdom and guile? The show seems to want me to start feeling things for this incestuous lech who attempted casual child murder and still hasn't really done anything that wasn't self-serving. There is no moral tension here. Jamie even makes this point here in about 60 seconds. So what I still don't understand is this. If I know this, and you know this, and even Jamie knows this, how does the show not know this? I pushed a boy out of tower window, crippled him for life. You know what? I think I've got it. Do you remember when sitcoms would run out of money or ideas so they put together a clip show where the main characters would reminisce about all the shit they've been through? Yeah, 50% of this episode is that, but without the clips, and somehow even more boring. This dragon is grounded and in range. How is Cersei not taking shots at it? Why is she not just obliterating all of them right now? This is Cersei we're talking about, right? There's this neat trick I've seen other shows do. I think it's called editing or something. Basically, it saves you from having to film every single footstep across every single second that passes so that your show can be A, less than an hour long, and B, entertaining. My lord, I am only a mouthpiece for our queen. And puppets. Cersei is queen of the Seven Kingdoms. You are her subject. Her reign is over. Great, another immovable, uninteresting object arguing with another unstoppably boring force. You've always loved your children. I just watched a dragonfly take a nosedive into my coffee and choose the sweet release of death by caramel latte rather than continue to watch its ancestors being disgraced by this drivel. That is where dragonflies come from, right? Her reign is over. Doesn't mean your baby has to die. I've always found threatening a mother's child to be a really effective way of preventing combat. This character actually used to be smart, right? I'm not just imagining that. So much of this show's success is owed to the opening theme. Every time I hear bum 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 I just can't help but get excited. Unfortunately, this uplifting experience just makes it all the worse every time this season disappoints me. So, yes, I'm giving the theme a sin for being too good. The show cuts from several seconds of Varys thinking unspoken thoughts to several seconds of Tyrion thinking unspoken thoughts, and here are my unspoken thoughts on the pacing of this final season. They say every time a Targaryen is born, the gods toss a coin and the world holds its breath. Not much for riddles where I'm from. This isn't a riddle. A metaphor or analogy maybe, but pretty straightforward and definitely not a riddle. Riddles have answers that require a paradigm shift and have answers like, he was short and carried an umbrella, the record skipped and he knew he was caught, or the horse's name was Sunday. You're welcome. I still don't know how her coin has landed, but I'm quite certain about yours. Being certain about other people's coins? I have known more kings and queens than any man living. I've heard what they say to crowds and seen what they do in the shadows. 
if Nandor the Relentless shows up right now and claims the throne, and then we cut to Colin Robinson talking Tyrion to death, I'll give back every single sin in the history of the channel. No grace? 20 seconds of Tyrion entering this room. Someone has betrayed me. This scene about who betrayed who and what does and doesn't count as betrayal goes on for all the some time. So much so that this episode manages to feel rushed and incredibly slow at the same time. Because you told him. You learned from Sansa. And she learned from Jon. And the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone. This series of revelations is like the skeleton dance for Game of Thrones. And just as tediously droll. But it doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter now. Cool! I love investing in things that don't matter. It's dark as f in this room, Varys. I'm not sure if you can see it hiding in the shadows, but I think I just found a rare undercandling sin. I mean, if you were hoping to burn that letter all the way, you maybe shouldn't have put that lid on so soon. That snuffs out the oxygen and stops the flame. If you want it to burn faster, throw some flour on it, which I in no way learned recently when I mistakenly tried to put out a kitchen fire with it. 20 seconds of Varys walking to his execution without Hannah Waddingham in her shame bell. I hope I deserve this. Truly, I do. I hope I'm wrong. Goodbye, old friend. I know we aren't in the habit of taking sins off for this disastrous season, but Varys may be one of the most complex and interesting characters in the history of television and could only exist on a show like Thrones. Conlothil is amazing, and we have to pour one sin out for the incredible Varys. Forgetting to bring the hot dogs to the campfire cookout. This was all she brought with her when we crossed the narrow sea. Her only possession. I guess today is just a day to burn everything. I'm just glad this stops now before she burns our entire ability to relate to her as a character and undoes seven seasons of brilliant character development. 20 seconds of Grey Worm leaving the room, and John entering the room without Hannah Waddingham in her shame bell. <laughs> 10 seconds of silence without Hannah Waddingham. Actually, it'd be weird if I brought the shame bell into this one. Far more people in Westeros love you than love me. And of course, John will now say he loves her, and then Danny will put him to the test with some incest -a snogging. And she'll take this as a sign that she has to burn the entire city to the ground, as one does. You can't expect them to be heroes. They're hostages. Look, Tyrion's clearly right through most of this scene, and the way Daenerys ignores him is befuddling and frustrating. But to insinuate that hostages can't be heroes is to ignore history, human nature, and common sense. You might even argue that hostages have a better chance at being heroes because of the inherent risk in their situation. 20 seconds of Tyrion leaving this room. Your brother was stopped trying to get past our lines. Followed by another 10 seconds of Tyrion leaving the room. 20 seconds of people walking into King's Landing. And since I think you're starting to get the point, I'm just going to add 10 cents for all the unnecessary walking, standing, sitting, not talking, staring, glaring, caring, and brooding in this episode. 30 seconds of boating. Sorry, I didn't see that one coming. Despite what you've heard from Lonely Island, there really isn't anything exciting going on here. Where are you going? I'm going to kill Queen Cersei. She is not. This goes on for all these show has time for this somehow works time. To be honest, I never really cared much for them. Innocent or otherwise. Tyrion says, you do care for one innocent, instead of saying, that seems dumb. The writers have shown you act selflessly multiple times throughout the show, so you saying this now, even insincerely, kind of undoes a good deal of your character development. Tomorrow. I suppose I'll die tomorrow, if not before. Why? The one-word question the scriptwriters of season eight failed to ever ask somehow winds up in the script they wrote. Your queen will execute you for this. If Daenerys can make it to the throne without wading through a river of blood, maybe she'll show mercy to the person who made that possible. Stupid season eight Tyrion continues to be stupid. Thinking this discount stayed bonnet staring off into the distance would distract us from all the gratuitous boat and arrow porn. This entire city is now in panic mode in anticipation of an attack, but how do they even know it's coming today, at this moment? I'm sure there are plenty of ways the news could have made it to Cersei and then filtered down to the common folk, but why is the show just assuming we'll fill in the gaps for it? Jamie does his best Assassin's Creed impression, but sadly this won't Altair my disdain for his arc in this season. Random soldier, random soldier, random soldier. Emotional investment? These two will now stand in for all the innocent lives about to be lost because this season needed one more thing to spend time on that wasn't the natural progression of the character arcs of the 317 main characters they were already failing. Okay, one more walking sin, but only because it goes on for so long that I'm pretty sure it's just there to pad the runtime. And Jamie's moving against traffic, which is like the most egregious thing a person could do in such a situation. Seeing all this dragon stuff from Euron's point of view was certainly cool, but this final reaction of casually jumping out of the way after almost being fire roasted is all the levels of I'm not surprised he survives this because it looks fake as shit. Fire!
being upset that you got the exact thing you just asked for. I simply refuse to believe that with all these soldiers standing here quietly to juice the maximum amount of tension out of this scene, not a single one of them heard anything beyond a slight rumble before the wrecking fireball Kool-Aid band its way through this wall. The entire Dothraki horde decided to let Discount Matt Smith live so that we can get some Grey Worm vengeance. And I'm all for some Grey Worm vengeance, but the Dothraki don't strike me as being tuned into the ideas of narrative flourish while sporting full-on murder boners. All we need is one good shot. And in an attempt to make sure every last character is dumbed down to the intellectual level of a box of Valerian hammers, now Cersei will say dumb naive things that are supposed to stand in for character development. This guy in John's right dies because despite looking in that direction, John decides not to warn him of this singular soldier who is very obviously approaching them with a sword and some violent intentions. Also, the four soldiers who do attack Grey Worm, John, Davos, and a few hundred of their men do so with some red shirt levels of unfounded optimism. And now the chorus of people asking for the bells to be rung will begin, but once again, how do any of these people know about the bell plan? And so begins one of the stupidest and nonsensical character decisions in television history. Not only has the city surrendered, not only has Danny's entire thing been about freeing the innocent, and not only are there at least a half dozen other ways to get revenge on or kill Cersei without harming the innocent, this is the worst way to accomplish her overall goals. She's literally destroying her own ability to lead. This whole thing is so terrible, I'm giving the show a sin for every single innocent person she kills. And I'm counting them all. There's 37 there. Another 119 there. 78 more there. Another 249 while these idiots are turning to guffaw. 98 in this blast. Oh, I'm counting that one too. This whole battle's on her, so that's another 414. And while Grey Worm is going ham, she fried another 732 on the other side of town. Another 57 here, another 134 on this run, 69 here, <laughs> nice, 239 here, these guys, this guy, 175 more, plus 56. War Hero watches carnage and horrors play out in slow motion, cliche. Oh, that run she got 632. That's like a single fire breath record, mostly thanks to the orphanage. Seven people in here, plus three killed by the falling debris. And then another 4,872, while the rest of this episode quickly and unsatisfactorily wraps up a bunch of other storylines. If I win, I'll bring your head to Cersei so you can kiss her. One last time. Of all the dumb things for this dumb episode of this dumb season of this not dumb show to spend its dumb time on, we're going with Euron versus Jamie. The Unsullied have breached the gates of the Red Keep. And now a single tear will fall from Cersei's eye as if calling out for us to give a sh**. I'm the man who killed Jamie Lannister. I don't care! Sandor, thank you. I kind of dig that Arya lets go of revenge and lives another day, but honestly, her turn is just as unearned as Danny's. She's been a stone-cold assassin hellbent on her list, and all it takes is a five-second stern talking to to turn her around. This particular piece of architecture conveniently stops crumbling right before the destruction passes the part they're standing on. Hello, big brother. What I say every time my phone gives me an ad for something I had a conversation about earlier in the day somehow makes it into the script. Also, this whole show is people just conveniently show up in the same place when it's time to fight. Why should Clegane Bowl be any different? Daenerys was doing so well at destroying the castle that it's a bit odd that she's now just flying in circles overhead. Yeah, that's you. That's what you've always been. Brothers. And now, Jamie and Cersei will have a single embrace, as if calling out for us to give a sh**. We'll now cut in between the somewhat interesting Clegane match and the much more uninteresting part where Arya walks out of the city while feeling empathy towards random strangers. Cutting away from excitement to boredom? What do you think you are, a Star Wars show? Although the dragon part of the sequence with Arya trying to escape their wrath is pretty amazing. We thought these powerful beasts were cool and fantastic for several seasons now, but the perspective is much different when you're on the receiving end of the horrors that they're clearly capable of. That's right, I'm gonna have to give one more sin off to this series and everyone who worked on it for this cinematic roller coaster. As Greg and Sandy continue to fight, how is baby brother surviving any of this? No pain, no clegane, I guess. I know I'm supposed to be feeling poetic justice or some shit as they fall in slow motion, but if a knife to the head barely phased Gregor, why are we supposed to believe that this fall into the fire will do anything? Who can't stay here? Yep, this is the same lady that Arya saw trying to get into the keep, and the same lady who helped her up in the street. Her name's Nora. That's right, she conveniently pops up so much that they named her in the subtitles. She accidentally leaves herself into this plot so much that if Arya's American history, Nora's freaking Forrest Gump. Stunt casting the Liberty Bell. 
The possible death of Arya has been teased so much in this one episode that her plot armor is beginning to rust from overuse. Jamie continues to not have bled out after all that stabbing, so I'm gonna have to continue sinning it. Nothing else matters. And now Jamie and Cersei will have a heartfelt conversation, as if calling out for us to give a skip? All I can think of as this ash rains down is that King's Landing has entered the upside down, and now I'm just mad Stranger Thrones doesn't exist. Looking a gift horse in its convenient mouth. Well, here we are, at the finale of the final season, watching the opening credits for the final time. Sending the opening credits of this show has become so comforting to me. I know I can always find a flaw somewhere in the full two minutes of Prelude because that's just how life is, right? If you want to find something wrong, you can always find it and justify it to yourself and even point it out to others. So thank you, Game of Thrones, for having credits so long that there's always some sh** to make up and giving us this weekly moment together. The episode opens up on 1 minute and 51 seconds of Tyrion, John, and Davos walking. Also, Tyrion isn't wearing a mask to avoid breathing in the charred remains of men, women, and children in this scene. It's a little hard to buy how much Danny's actions affected Tyrion and Jon when they can't even bother to help this guy passing them. At least give him aloe or something. Would aloe help? Just stop and assist the man before his skin falls off. There are skeletons in the foreground of this building that was directly on Drogon's dragonfire path, meaning the dragonfire was so hot it entered a building and melted the muscle and connective tissue, leaving the bones behind. This makes me wonder how the corpses in the streets still had their tissue intact, considering those people had no cover at all. John survives this. The writers were like, the foundation of the map room cracks open, symbolically showing a divide. And the props department was like, bricks everywhere. If you think you've added too many or that they're on top of something of storytelling importance, well, you are wrong. More bricks. When you wonder how this episode managed to be movie length, just remember they chose to show Tyrion picking up a torch rather than just get to him walking down the stairs with a torch. We can put two and two together and figure out he found a light source. So Tyrion confirms the end of his family's lineage and uses his super instincts to dig through a rubbled keep and get directly to his sibs. Then he turns around and gets back in time to hear Danny's speech, which convinces him she's turning mad. Did I? What the f*** that right? Maybe I should have paid attention in Castle Masonry class at Fantasy World Building School, but where did all the rubble come from? The floor above? A buckled wall? Right now, it just appears that there's random self-standing piles of brick that aren't from an important load-bearing archway or something. Pan up and show me the hole in the floor to justify how they're laying on top of a massive pile of bricks. Or cover my tuition and send me back to school. You know, honestly, they look really good for being crushed by the weight of all the bricks in this castle. That's not how CPR works. And now, because we have time, we will watch John take every single step along this path to the Queen. Do you like feet? Well, boy, are you gonna love all the walking we have in store for you today. <laughs> How did Worm get up here so fast? He was slitting throats a few minutes ago and John went directly to find Danny. Unless even the fictional characters aren't feeling a sense of timing and decided to take a tea break rather than show us how this all ends. <laughs> oh, shit. All hail one of the best shots of Queen Danny in the series. But also I blame this shot for the spike in angel wing murals popping up for photo ops in all major cities. Dear Sin Diary, Today I spent 30 minutes watching braiding tutorials on YouTube in order to confidently say that Rapunzel Targaryen has approximately 50 yards of hair on her head, and her posture will be horrible if she isn't highly focused on keeping the weight distributed properly. I find it all too convenient that Danny's army remnants fit perfectly in this courtyard. I bet Drogon munched extra people, just to be sure it had a cinematic aesthetic. I like to think the Dothraki stop and look at Danny in awe because they can't believe her voice can carry all this way so clearly. Shaka Regis and Han, Regis and Dati. Did Danny and Drogon rehearse this speech together? Because it's either that or Drogon has really awesome dramatic dragon timing. What are you doing here? He sure did say, How the f did you get up the massive set of stairs past an army without being noticed, strangely? I'm gonna know a killer when I see one. And because Arya says so, we're supposed to follow suit and turn our Danny adoration to disgust without actually seeing much more than a wink at her madness? I think so. I mean, not. I, I don't trust anything happening right now. Our queen doesn't keep prisoners for long. Which makes me ask the question, why is Tyrion still alive? They were lining up soldiers on the street and slicing their necks like it was a normal deli slice Tuesday. Why does Tyrion get to live any longer? Danny even warned him the last time she would kill him if he betrayed her again. My father was an evil man. My sister was an evil woman. Pile up all the bodies of all the people they ever killed. 
There still won't be half as many as our beautiful queen slaughtered in a single day. Ha, huh, the old game of my father and sister might have murdered a lot of people, but they aren't as murdery as your girlfriend slash aunt. I know it all too well. We. Everywhere she goes, evil men die, and we cheer her for it. Well, that's your fault, show, for making her so damn amazing. I wonder why John is allowed to talk freely to Tyrion without someone else keeping an eye on them. John tried to stop Grey Worm from killing prisoners of war, and Danny knows John is the one true king. Certainly someone is suspicious enough to eavesdrop as Tyrion hard hints at a Danny assassination. This scene just made me think of a joke. What's John's middle name? It's walking in the... Get it? John walking in the snow? Because it's... And... <laughs> Hey, don't blame me, but blame the finale for being so boring I'm trying to fill the emptiness with something entertaining. As amazing as this looks, I refuse to believe a fucking dragon would be cold enough to accumulate layers of snow. Can't verify this by research because this is a fantasy world, but this fantasy world is about to show this same dragon melt the shit out of an iron throne. So you know Drogon runs warm. Danny gets to see the throne for the first time and realize what she's accomplished, blah, blah, blah. But what I can't figure out is why there are no guards with Danny. She's been walking all over the city with guards in tow. Makes no sense why they wouldn't be up here with her now. There could be some straddlers hiding up here ready to strike. Not to mention, because there are conveniently no guards, John is able to kill her with ease. You are my queen. No. And always. Which will only be a few more seconds. But John is an asshole and doesn't clarify that. Inserting to the hilt without explicit consent. The end. Overkilm. Looking away from a dragon that's still considering its calorie intake for the day and determining your snack potential. We find out shortly that John was arrested for murdering Danny shortly after this, but how were they able to even prove it? Drogon took her away, so unless John was dumb enough to confess, he could have easily said she rode off on Drogon and he had no clue where she was going. But John probably is dumb and love enough to confess. The next 30 seconds are dedicated to Tyrion's thoughtful expression, rather than giving us 30 seconds of Danny revealing a few more surefire reasons she was beyond redeemable. Say another word about killing my brother and I'll cut your throat. Threatening to murder someone in front of so many witnesses. If Yara comes back one day with a slit throat, Arya better hope she's got a rock-solid alibi. There is land in the Reach. Good land. The people that used to live there are gone. Make it your own. Start your own house with the Unsullied as your bannerman. Grey Worm and the Unsullied have all been castrated. There's no way for them to procreate and start a house and have any kind of family legacy. This isn't the great offer that Davos thinks it is. Everyone has heard enough words from you. You're right. And yet the finale will continue to give us maximum Tyrion talks. If the end story is about the Stark children, then why not let them have their speeches and screen time? And if this story isn't about Ned's bloodline changing the future of Westeros, then what are we even doing here? You're the most powerful people in Westeros. Choose one. This works. And uncle, understand. please sit. Embarrassing uncles. He crossed beyond the wall, a crippled boy, and became the three-eyed raven. Whatever that means. A still night's watch. The world will always need a home for bastards and broken men. You mean exiles and people deemed to be a threat to bloodlines? Yeah, great wheel breaking there, show. You shall take no wife, hold no lands, father no children. And all of this will be policed by precisely no one. No one is very happy. Except Tyrion, I would assume, considering he gets to walk free while Jon has to serve a life sentence at the Night's Watch. Was it right? What I did? It doesn't feel right. Questions the writers had for George R. R. Martin somehow make it into the episode. Ask me again in ten years. Are they foreshadowing the release of another Game of Thrones series in ten years? They are, aren't they? No! Audience at home, don't turn that dial. From the show that delivered riveting dialogue that's propelled you from slump to slump throughout this episode, they bring you to Brienne, reading a f***ing book. Okay, but why turn the page to continue writing when there's so much more room down here? Jamie's entry here in the Book of Brothers reads, He took River Run from the Tully Rebels without loss of life. The corpse of Brendan Blackfish Tully might have something to say about that. Forgetting the dot on the lowercase j. Of all the shows to forget the tittles. Yeesh. She spelled sister wrong. Wait, no. Lover. She spelled lover wrong. Wait, no. Mother is to There is zero chance that ink had dried yet, so all the writing Brienne just completed is now a spudge. What's this? A song of ice and fire. Roll appendixes. And Drogon? Any word? No, that's still a terribly unoriginal name for a dragon. 
Oh, you were asking if anyone had spotted him. I see. But I still stand by what I said about the name thing. The Master of Coin looks forward to helping the Master of Ships. Speaking in the third title. I once brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel. Are Tyrion's final words in this series. Careful, John. Remember, you can't take a wife. The end. The cinematic angles cut thematically between the siblings, except for Bran. Bran, who could be f***ing warging right now, by the way. His siblings walk, but Bran rolls and flies, and why aren't we seeing any of that? The end? No, not really the end, though. Where is Bran riding Drogon, like Falcor style, through the air with his fist raised? Come on, Thrones, come on! Ah! Despite appearances, I think you'll find the cities on the rock. They even got a special map that lets you choose who you want to dump your poop on. The first they heard was a noise like a hurricane coming down from the north. The pines on the mountain creaked and cracked in the hot, dry wind. Look at you. You're grown up. What do you think you're doing? Master Falcor, master! Don't be afraid. Is that a command, Lady Stark? Don't call me that. As you wish, milady. That day, she was amazed to discover that when he was saying, as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. I know, Dad. He's got many faces. I'd like to take his, his face off. Stay alive, no matter what occurs. I will find you. My lord, we're not soldiers. Nothing for you. If I wanted to erase the world of men, I'd start with you. This isn't about you. I stole a considerable number of books from the Citadel Library. Survive the fist of the first man. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. You lost a client. There are lesser fishing lodges. No repercussions from Lewiston? I'm Danny Crane. Whoremongering is still an option for you. Would that? It were so simple. What do we have here? What's up, Nard? My nipples. It's freezing out there. Move. Well, it's a very attractive proposition, gentlemen, but unfortunately not practical. You see, my medium is light. It'll be pitch dark. I won't be able to see a thing. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold. Pick up! Get me down from here! Let us out! Let us out! At least we're already in a crib. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. You might be surprised at the lengths I'd go to avoid joining the Army of the Dead. I could think of no organization less suited to my talents. The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Hey, Lord of the Flame. Your tail's on fire. As you wish. I'm not dead. Incoming. We've been trying to contact you regarding your car's extended warranty. Harold Crick was a man of infinite numbers, endless calculations and remarkably few words. So who's Lord of Storm's End now? I don't know, Your Grace. Does anyone? 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 It's okay. His, uh, his mother just died. I've never slept with a knight before. Take me to Pleasure Town. I've never begged for anything. But I'm begging you. Don't do this. Please. Whatever, I do what I want. Your sister offered me River Rock. She's beautiful, she's rich, she's got huge tracts of land. Yes, well, Liam, 
The nights have been getting longer and I need you to get me in touch with NASA immediately. When you tell him that the moon is out of orbit. I'm sure he knows how it happens, Sam. What have I told you, Martha? You said it was safer than my safe. I would never say it. Come on, let's bet. There's not much for riddles where I'm from. There were three men in a boat with four cigarettes and no matches. How did they manage to smoke? It was me! Soldier! Pick me, pick me, pick me. Your Grace, the Iron Fleet is burning. The gates have been breached. We're fucked. And look at me. Look at me! I'm the captain now. I have the high ground! Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. Look at me! Just look at me. I'm the captain now. So, how was Burning Man? My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. It's over. These men are prisoners. This isn't over until I say it's over! Sorry, okay, relax, dude. Yeah, I can fly. I don't know what to say, really. Three minutes till the biggest battle of our professional lives. Did you bring any wine? No. I am not drinking any fucking Merlot! Doctor? 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 Stop looking at me, swan!